The interesting thing is, evangelism is often, where do you want to go when you die? Heaven or hell? But Jesus never asked that question. Jesus came to give us life. He came to change our position from being in the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But it wasn't about bringing us to heaven. It was about bringing heaven to earth. It was about our life reflecting heaven on earth. That's what it was. I was just thinking of the um, shofar, Louisa, but you've already, you've already done it. That's right, it was already done before, so. <laughs> so, um, so we've already done it, so that's, that's cool. So it's, you know, Jesus didn't come to say, well, you know, if you want to go to heaven, choose me. He came to say, I've come to give you a new position in life. I've come to bring you back to what Adam had before the fall. I've come to bring you back into the presence of the Father. And I've come to give you life and life more abundant. He came to give us life, to fill us with his life. His life fills us. We've got a new heart and we've got the mind of Christ. God's given us a new heart with our spirits being regenerated. Everything is brand new. And so we've got an invitation to live out of the newness of life. And, and I think we have to stop thinking about heaven and hell in that, because honestly, if somebody says, where do you want to go when you die, heaven or hell, what are you going to choose? <laughs> Obviously, in your right mind, it'd be heaven, right? There are some people who think, oh, I really don't believe in either. You know, when I'm dead, I'm dead. That's the end of the journey. But it's not about that. God actually wants you to live his life on earth. That's what it's about. Living the life of Christ on earth, bringing heaven to earth. Matthew 6.10, God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was never about taking us to heaven. It is always about bringing heaven to earth. And so it's recognizing that Jesus came to offer us his life, his health, his prosperity, his wisdom, his everything, so that we can live a life that is totally stripped of everything that is from the old. So I'm um, not saying that heaven's not important. We're citizens of heaven, but it's about how we live on earth. And I think people would rather live a good life on earth that will lead to heaven. But they tend to think, oh, if I choose heaven because of fear, because I don't want to go to hell, so I'll choose heaven. And so fear is the undergirding force of their choice it's only going to be fear that keeps them in the kingdom. And fear is not in God's kingdom. Right? It's love. I understand what you're saying, and it seems very general and broad, and I'm seeing all this time. It's not general and broad. It's fear, the statement is if a person comes in just because they're afraid of, of going to hell. That's like, that's your base instinct. You don't want to drop off a, yeah. your base instinct. But then, what so do I need to do to preserve my life? Well, Go to church, do all the right things. That's only if it's presented that way. But most but of the time, relationship with Jesus. but most of the time, the gospel is not presented as a relationship. Yeah. So what I'm talking locked, about, a relationship. Are locked in that mindset that yeah. It's, it's just a rescue. Yeah. Sorry? I would think that would come out once you've got them saved. Relationship. Which relationship? Relationship. Yeah, if they're discipled into Christ, into relationship. Most of them don't want to be discipled. That's why they don't come back to church when they get saved. They get saved, but they don't want to come to church. You know, so there's a whole lot of things. What I'm saying is Jesus said, Jesus said, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I came to give you life and life more abundant. And so we offer them a life. We offer them the life of Christ. We offer them, how would you like to live a life that is God-filled? 
How would you like to live a life that flows in the essence of God himself? How would you like to live a life that flows in divine health, divine prosperity, divine wisdom? How would you like to live that? I'm not saying the other way is wrong, but I'm saying we've got a generation out there who have not been brought up with putting their hands on their chest and saying, you know, God saved the queen in school. They've, they've not been brought up going to Sunday school. We've got a whole generation that have never heard the true gospel. And so the way we've presented it in the past has been to people who have heard the gospel. So it's a completely different generation that we're dealing with now and we have to change. I'm not saying that heaven is not important. I'm not saying I don't want them not to go to... I don't want anyone to go to hell. But what I'm saying is sometimes we have to change what we do or say or think in order to get the fish. Change the bait. Yeah, the wisdom of the fishermen that came out in the prayer this afternoon. We have to change the bait. So I'm not saying yes or no. I'm saying, but we have to not, and again, it's not large and broad. It's as led by the Spirit of God. You know? Somebody with cancer. How would you like God to so fill your life that cancer dies? Right? Yeah. So it's recognising that, that Jesus came to meet the void, the needs. So nothing against, please don't stop evangelising or anything like that. I'm just asking you to maybe, maybe, depending on the person you're talking to, there's a different element, a different way of, of um, proposing the truth. Because all because we've done it this way for, you know, 50 years or 100 years, doesn't mean it's always right for the present time. And I preached back in December about present day truth. First Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it's the, tr the truth of the present that we need to be aware of. So again, you know, like evangelism is really important. And yes, the question of heaven or hell is important. But really, I would rather have been told that there's a much better way to live and I will end up in heaven than to go through everything I did just not to go to hell. So it's just something to think about. I'm not saying it's true or I'm just something to think about because Jesus said, I came to give you life. I came to give you life. And if we actually taught people when they got born again that, okay, today you are saved. Today, you've come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Today, you've been translated out of the darkness into the light. Today, your spirit has become alive and you're a brand new creation in Christ today. That also means today, you have been filled with divine health and sickness and disease has no right to be in your body. Today, you have been um, brought into a place of blessing and prosperity so poverty, lack and debt can be cut off your life in Jesus' name. As you come, it's not just about salvation and going to heaven. It is about the salvation of life. Yes. Yes. It's about, we taught them that. That would be different. Like, yes. I know I'm born again. Right, nobody can rob me of that, but it took me a bit, a few years to get hold of the fact that the same time I got born again, I got healed and I got prospered. Because it's not taught. New, yeah, Kenyan, New Creation Realities. So we've got one of Kenyan's books on the table. It's not that one, it's what happened from the cross to the throne. But um, recognising these things, the other thing that we seem to have moved away from not talking about open heaven, talking about the church in general. There's so much talk about end times, pre, post, mid-tribs. Um, the, um, what do you call it, that's happening in the States, the, the eclipse that's happening in the States in the month of April and the number of towns it's crossing and all of that. But we've lost the fact that we're supposed to be a people of faith. Where is faith being taught? Where is faith being discussed? Where are people being taught this is faith and this is the only thing that attracts Jesus' attention is faith. Jesus is looking for the jewel of faith. You know, um, Hebrews 11.6, that the only way we can please God is by faith. 
Hebrews 11.1, 1, that faith is now, now faith is, now faith is the substance of things we hope for, the evidence of things not seen, faith. And, you know, it's, it's by faith that we move mountains. It's by faith that people get healed. It's by faith that people get, get born again. It's by faith, by grace through faith for salvation. But we've kind of walked away from faith. Now I'm hearing more about, well, you can be healed by frequencies. Yes, you can. But the thing is, we were told if we lay hands on the sick, they get healed. We were told that if we release the name of Jesus, they get healed. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things that we've kind of moved away from. And the central truth of the word of God is faith. It's faith. What do you actually believe? And, and there's, um, there's faith. Like when we get born again, we're given the measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God gives us the measure of faith. But then faith can be increased. Romans 10, 17, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is so important. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. So if I have all the, if I understand the frequencies and I understand end time events and I understand, you know, the eclipses and everything, if I understand all of these things and I'm, I'm flowing in gifts of prophecy and all, but I have not got faith. I have not pleased my Father because it's only by faith that we please him. So how much are we actually living by faith? How much of it is kind of like on automatic? How much is your faith growing? Are you knee level? Faith, ankle deep faith, knee level, hip, are you swimming in the river of faith? Are you actually, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I will find the verse, I think it's verse 7. Are you actually filled with the spirit of faith? Like there's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of glory, the spirit of hope. There is the spirit of faith. So that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13, I think. And faith speaks, and we can see that in this scripture. Having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. So there comes a place where you can be so possessed by faith that the spirit of faith is operating in you, which is a different thing again to the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit. If you look at Wigglesworth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Daniel, um, Catherine Coleman. They moved in an amazing anointing of God, but they would have got nowhere without, the, without faith. And so they were possessed by a spirit of faith. So have you even thought about asking the spirit of faith to fill you? Spirit of faith, possess me. Spirit of faith, take hold of me. God, I thank you that you've given me a measure of faith. God, I thank you that I can increase my faith by hearing the word of God, by hearing and hearing the word of God. I thank you that my faith can grow. It can um, multiply. But God, I want to be possessed by the spirit of faith. I want to live an extraordinary life. I want to move in an anointing of the Holy Ghost that defies description because I want to see the reality of God upon this earth. I want to see the reality of the kingdom of heaven upon earth. I want to see people's lives changed, healed, delivered, set free, turned around, businesses prospered, corrupt governments come down because of, um, and the bottom line is if there's no faith, it's not going to happen because faith is the substance it's the substance. Turn to Hebrews 11, chapter 1. It says, now faith is. So faith is always present tense. Always present tense. Now faith is. The substance or the assurance of things hoped for or expected. It is the conviction, the evidence, the title deed of things not seen. 
So sometimes we can be believing God for something and the devil comes along and says, oh, you can't have that. And we say, wait a minute, excuse me, I'm in faith and faith is my title deed. Faith is the evidence that I bring into the courts of heaven to say this is mine and you get your hands off it in Jesus' name. We live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith and not by appearance. We live by faith and not by what our soul senses or perceive. We live by faith. And faith is Christ's perspective. Faith is seeing things from God's point of view. Faith is so important. Faith. And faith flows with an authority. It flows with authority. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we've got different levels of faith. Just, oh, I'm so healed. Different levels of faith. G Peter received a measure of faith when he recognised Christ as the Messiah, didn't he? He got a revelation, oh my gosh, you're the Messiah. So he got faith. He got faith to follow Jesus when Jesus said, come, walk on the water. He walked on the water, but then his faith failed because he walked by appearance and not by faith. He saw the storm. He felt the wind and crash. His faith didn't last either when he um, disowned Jesus three times. But then on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, that's a completely different Peter. And faith was strong and evident and the power of the Holy Spirit flowed through him. So in Matthew chapter 7, at the very end, it says in verse 28, after he tells them to build their house on the rock, which is doing the word of God, it says in verse 27, no, verse 28, now it happened... that when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For Jesus was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So the key word there is authority. And the authority, the theme of authority carries right through to Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, where it says, in summoning his 12 disciples, Jesus gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. They were given the authority. So Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9 are all about the authority of Jesus Christ on the earth and that authority he's given to us. And if you have a look at it he had authority to forgive sins he had authority to still the storm he had authority to touch a leper and cure him and not be not be made unclean he had authority to do all of these things the authority comes because he had faith in God he knew his God he knew his God and John chapter 5 verse 19 it says you know that he only ever did the things his father told him to do that is a narrow path that is a circumcised lifestyle. But moving back to authority, this is our Jesus. And if you want to attract his attention, it is not going to be by your holiness. It is not going to be by, well, it could have a part to do with holiness. But I'll tell you what he's really looking for is faith. So in, in um, Matthew chapter 8, it says in verse 1 and 2, When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and was bowing down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I'm willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And then Jesus said to him, See, you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony. So this leper came to him and bowing down before Jesus, worshipping before him, he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, the, the beautiful compassion of Christ, Jesus reached out his hand and he, he touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. Now under the law, if Jesus touched that leper, he would have been made unclean. But Jesus is above the law. He fulfilled the law. 
And so he said, I'm willing, be clean. He was not contaminated by touching a leper, but he stretched out his hand, I will be clean immediately. And so the authority that is in him released the power. So when you pray for someone, how expectant are you that you are going to see an immediate response? Or is it like, well, in Jesus' name, be healed, but then we take a wait and see. Hopefully, God, something's going to happen. I remember years ago going home from a church meeting. Man, I was pumped. I was so pumped. And I went into my regular service station to get some petrol. And the guy looked terrible. And I said, are you okay? What's wrong? And he said, oh, I've got a toothache. And I said, oh, can I pray for you? Which shocked me, I think, as much as it shocked him. And, and he said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, if you want to. So I, I prayed for him. And then I shot out of there. And I said, oh, God, I hope that worked. Like, oh God, like woman of faith and power. Oh God, I hope that worked. And God said to me, whose reputation are you worried about? Yours or mine? And I went, oh, I was worried about mine. Sorry, God. This is my regular service station, you know, like, so, you know, but it comes back to what do you actually expect when you lay hands on people? What do you expect when you speak a word that you know is anointed and comes from the heart of God? Do you actually expect it to pierce their hearts? What is your expectation? Because your expectation reveals the level of your faith. Your expectation actually reveals the level of your faith. So what do you actually expect? And this Goshen, like this year, it's our Goshen year. It's covenant revelation, Goshen. Goshen actually means draw near. We are called to draw near to God to enter into our Goshen. And faith, you can't get much closer to God than faith because he places it within us. And then in um, verse 5, you've got the centurion, a Roman soldier, not even an Israelite, not a Jew, but a Roman soldier who commands about a hundred soldiers. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Look at the willingness of Jesus. So do we really believe that he's that willing? I'll come and heal him. I will be cleansed. Like, I mean, there's no delay from Jesus. There's no holding back. It's like, yeah, of course, what's the need? Let me meet it. Like, and, and somehow, religiosity and churchianity has brought about a kind of a time lapse. Well, I prayed, so I guess down the track this will happen. But Jesus wants to meet every need now. And so he reached out his hand and, and, and he said, yeah, I'll come. I'll come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I'm, I'm not good enough for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. I'm also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. He said, none of the Jewish people in covenant with God have expressed a faith like this. I had to hear it from a Gentile. I had to hear it from a Roman centurion. No one else had the faith in Israel like he does. Did you want to say something? So that was the... Oh, healed. <laughs> but it's the... Um, you know, he said, no, no, no one, no one, no one in Israel has got faith like this. Can you imagine what Jesus must have felt? He's the covenant people of God. And he says, no one has got faith like this. That attracted his attention. When we have faith that draws the, it's like a jewel that Jesus is looking for. It's like, wow, they've got faith. I'm moving in there. Yes, look at that. Yes, I'm moving in there. I'm telling you, faith will stop Jesus from walking by and bring him into your presence. Faith is powerful. Faith is powerful. But sometimes...
what we think is faith is simply a soul belief. It's not vitally alive. It's like a passive acceptance. Well, yes, I've prayed God will heal them at some stage. God, I know that at some stage you're going to give us a venue. God, I know that, you know, I've prayed, so God, somewhere down the track, I know that you're going to heal them. I thank you that you will heal them. But no, faith is now. Faith is now. We've got to stop thinking in terms of earthly time and move in accordance with heavenly timing. And as far as Jesus is concerned, when it's heavenly timing, it's now. Faith is now. And so, you know, his, his faith attracted, the, the centurion's faith attracted Jesus. And, um, you know, it's, it's like a jewel. And then he said in verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. It shall be done for you as you have believed. What are you believing? Because I know with regards to the venue for here, I recognise that I'd fallen into a passive faith. Oh God, I've prayed. I just believe you're going to connect us with the right venue at the right time. God, I thank you. It's all in your hands, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> thank you, God. And I'll try not to whinge when I have to set up and fill the car and Oh, God, I want everything out of my house that belongs to the church. God, wind, 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 moan, 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 not an ounce of faith. But when I say stuff like, God, you must now, you must now give me a venue for the church, that's faith. You know, the, the uh, One New Man translation for the Our Father, um, which I don't have with me. You've got it? Matthew 6. Just one or two pages back. Thank you, Lynn. This is the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer in the One New Man Bible. Our Father, who is in the heavens, your name must at once be made holy. Your kingdom must now come. Your will must be done right now as in heaven also on earth. You must now give us today the things necessary for our existence. You must right now forgive our sins for us in the same manner as we've completed forgiving everyone of everything big and little against us and do not lead us into temptation but you must now rescue us from the evil one. Mm -hmm. Amen. But it's that covenant language now now it's covenant right it's covenant we've got to learn to talk covenant one new man bible it brings out the jewish roots of the one new man bible bringing out the jewish roots in the word of god so we've got that and then in verses 14 to 17 pete's mother-in-law is sick and she's in bed with a fever and Jesus just touched her hand and the fever left her and she began and she got up and began waiting on him. So I used to think, oh, that'd be right. That's the, that's the place of the woman serving the household. <laughs> but it wasn't that. It was the fact that she was so healed that strength and vitality and energy got back to her that it was a sheer joy to serve the one who healed her, right? And then he fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah. See, this is Jesus. He doesn't waste time. He wants things to happen now. He doesn't want people to suffer. He doesn't want kids to be on drugs longer than they have to be. He doesn't want people in hospital suffering for longer than they have to. It's now. It was all done at the cross. It was done before the beginning of time. And he's saying, now, faith is now. Come, take hold of it. Release it and, let, and see amazing things happen. See, amazing things happen. And if you go through, there's about 10 circumstances in Matthew 8 and Matthew chapter 9, 10 areas where Jesus moves in authority. He moves over a storm, um, sickness, death, forgiveness, sins, all of that. There's 10 places in that there are 10 responses of the people and then 10 reactions from Jesus. It's a whole, like Matthew is all about um, group shots. Math Mark is, is all single shots, like single selfies. 
Mark is all about that. But Matthew is about groupies. He takes groups. So there's a group of 10 here and there's a group of some, a 10 here. So it's all in groups in Matthew. Luke's the story and John's the mystic one. But Mark is definitely snapshots, selfies happening all the time. You know, but you've got to, you've got to understand the flow and, and what, what's happening and what is being presented. And in Matthew, we are taught, man, no one ever taught like Jesus. He teaches with such authority. They were astonished at his authority. And then to prove his authority straight away, first up, there's a leper. Then there's a centurion servant. Then there's Peter's mother-in-law. Then there's all the people around the door. And it goes on and all the way through. He's showing his authority. He's showing his compassion. He's showing his power. And, but all of it comes about because people came to him on the basis of faith. If that leper had not come on a basis of faith, he would not have been cured. If the centurion had not recognised who Jesus was and said, you know what? I recognise authority. And I recognise that you're flowing in some kind of authority that I've not seen on earth. You don't even have to say, and just speak one word, and my servant will be healed. It's all about Jesus. And sometimes we forget that it is all about Jesus. Even our prayers... Whatever we ask in his name, the name of Jesus will be given to us. It's all about Jesus. We tend to think sometimes it's about how much time I've spent in the word, how much time I've spent praying in tongues. It's about how much I've learnt. It's about um, oh, so many different aspects. It's even about how much I've believed and how much I've fasted and how much I've done these things. It's nothing to do with that. That plays a very minor part. The big part is Jesus has already done it and it is available to everybody. He did it at the cross. So any prayers that I pray are simply by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If they're prayers from the soul, they're not going to get answered anyway. You know, so it's, it's anything that I've done. It's got, see, we have to come back to being word-fed, spirit-led. Yeah. Word-fed, spirit-led. What's the whole counsel of God say? If you study it right through from Genesis to Revelation, take the time, study the word, because you're entering into a season where people in the world don't know the word, argue the word, don't believe the word. And so you've got to know the word. Why do we believe abortion is wrong? And you can't simply say, well, God said because that's not an argument that, that will break down their heart. We have to know. We have to know these things. But when they see that your life is a sign and a wonder, that your life is the sign and is the wonder, because of the miracles and the signs and the wonders that flow behind you, man, they'll want what you've got. Because everybody comes to an end of themselves. Everybody comes to a place where they can't figure out how to get out of the mess they're in. They don't know where to find the next bit of money to pay for the food. Everybody finds, you know, every unbeliever. But if that draws them to Jesus, Jesus wants to instantly get them out of the mess. And I understand that sometimes there are things that we need to learn. But that comes in the discipling. We need to learn to be able to disciple people in truth. They need to have God encounters. Like an encounter with God, man. Wow. You know, God spoke to me this past week and he said to me, your marriage was never a marriage. And it just broke something on the inside of me because, you know, because oh, 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 he told me a whole heap of stuff and I wrote it all down. I had a God encounter, which changed that in me forever. Healed wounds that I've been carrying for over 40 years. Fixed me up, you know. So, you know, this is what God wants to do. I don't care now what other people say. I know what God said to me. 
I had a God encounter. So we need to pray for the people around us, people in open heaven. Have God encounters. Have God encounters. Have an encounter with the spirit of truth. Have an encounter with the word of God. You know, every time you open your Bible, you're opening up Jesus Christ. He is the word of God. He is the living word of God. He is. And it says that the word of God is medicine, life and healing to all our flesh. So every time I open up the word, thank you, God, I've got a dose of medicine from your word. I thank you that I'm face to face with Jesus. I thank you for the Holy Spirit leading me into the truth. I thank you for opening my eyes that I might behold wondrous things in your word. See, if we're not based on the word of God, we've got a very flimsy foundation. And Jesus is the word. But it's faith. Because faith will be the authority that flows through you. And sometimes when I look at my life and I see what's there and then those words from Matthew 8, according to what you believe, so be it. Well, I don't like what I've just believed. I need to change that. I don't like the doctor's report. I don't like... The bank statement, I don't like whatever it might be, I don't like it. That's not what I'm believing for. But we've got to come back to a living, aggressive faith. Otherwise, we can speak to the mountain, mountain be moved, mountain be moved, mountain be moved, and it just sits there. But when it's like a grain of mustard seed, that is alive with life, waiting to just burst forth. And you know the word radical actually means when, when there's a seed, the radical is the part where the seed breaks open and the roots go down into the ground. That's radical. That's what that actually means. So when there's a, like a radical move of the Holy Ghost, it means the seed's been split open, the roots are going deep, and now life is going to come forth up, up front. Life is going to flow. So the thing is... What have you settled for? What have you settled for? And you might not have settled. You might be powering on in God, doing amazing things. But where are the testimonies? Where's the changes in the people around us? Because to be quite honest with you, most of the young ones, this, well, some, I won't say most. That's a generalisation. But a lot of the younger generations don't really believe in heaven or hell. They think that when you die, that's it. That there's some kind of an electric current, possibly. But when you die, that's it. But when they see we live heaven on earth, when they see the fruit of heaven on earth, that's when they, they plug in. And faith that actually allows you to say to, straight to the face of someone, oh, I'm not receiving that. Like a friend of mine when she was given, I think, oh, she given 5% chance of living with cancer. And the doctor said, you've got about a 5% chance to live. And I can still remember she shuck, stuck her skinny little finger in his face and said, don't you dare tell me when I die. That's between me and God. It's got nothing to do with you. And she's still alive. You've got to take your authority because if we allow what they say to stay over us, we carry the weight of it. Life and death are in the power of your words. That's the only thing that's released. And so, you know, you often see me doing this. Cutting that off my life. Not having that in my life. Might not be in a position to say anything. <laughs> nope. Nope. And nope. <laughs> Particularly at family gatherings. <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, I'm on my hair today is really. <laughs> but you can't allow it to stay. Because if you entertain it, you give it life. So what's, it comes back, word-fed, spirit-led. Word-fed, 
spirit-led. And I know for, for us, Mary Ann, Shelley, it's like going back about 45 years. <laughs> but that's the power. And uh, Mary Ann had a thing last week, a revelation last week that the Holy Spirit was stirring up the winds. Well, if you want to soar in those winds, it's by faith. By faith you can soar. By faith you can move with the Holy Ghost. Because he's going to ask you to do stuff that is not going to seem normal or natural. Think about the prophet. What do you mean, throw a stick into the river? How's that going to raise, how's that going to get the axe head back to me when I need it? That's not going, that's ridiculous. But he didn't think with his head, he just obeyed the man of God. And the miracle happened. So often we, we reason our faith out instead of allowing our faith to get rid of the logic. So it comes back to the word of God. What does the word of God say? And I love to hear all of the things that come up in our prayer meeting and everything. But where's the scripture? What scripture is that based on? You know, like I've got a friend who prays with me and she sees crowns and all sorts of amazing things. And I'm like, I don't see it. But I know there's a presence, I know something's happening, but I don't see like she does. But, oh, I see a crown. And oh, I see this. And I said, well, what does that actually mean? Like, I mean, if you're seeing that for me, what are you actually saying? And what scripture are you basing it on? What's the scripture that you base this on? Because if, there's, if I can't find a scripture to back it up, I'm not accepting it. So... Abandon yourselves. Seriously, just let go of everything and abandon yourselves. Easier said than done. Just when I think I'm abandoned, I find I'm hanging on to something wildly with one hand. But continue to abandon yourself to God because he is wanting to do something amazing and mighty through your life. Yeah. He's wanting to bring revelation of the word upon the earth. He's wanting your life to be a sign and a wonder so that the people around you can see the reality of heaven on earth. He wants people to see what it's like to be filled with the life of Christ and to live from that. Abandon yourselves. Pray in the Spirit till you get lost in the Spirit. Because you're never lost in God. But sometimes it takes a while to put down the soul, to put down what we think, how we handle it, what we're seeing, what we're sensing, and rationalising everything with the word that we do know rather than allowing for a fresh revelation. Abandon yourselves to God and allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to flow through you in a way it's never flown through you before. Ask God to keep you in the truth, that you would know the truth, that if you are believing any lies or any, anything that's not of God, let it be destroyed. Yeah. Let truth be established. Mm -hmm. yes. For some of you, there's like an open door right in front of you. And there's this big invitation sign. But it's been open for a long time. For some of you, there's, there's doors that are just starting to open. For some of you, there's been doors that have been open for a while. And God's saying, come on in. What he said to me the other day was, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> the water's fine, come on in. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> but we have, to, we have to abandon ourselves. And very much like Rhys Howell, abandon, abandon our will. Abandon even our gifts. Even like Cambry said before, abandon our sins because they're not ours. Everything is his. He took it all. 
So if he's taken everything, what have you received from him? Have you received the fullness of life? Have you received the fullness of the life of Christ on the inside of you? Like, what have you received in exchange? What are you actually living in exchange? What are you living in exchange? If everything is his, and now I've got everything that he is and has and does, how does that change my life? How does that change my life? And that's a question that will be different for each and every one of you as it's answered. And I think I might just go and have a milkshake somewhere because it looks like everybody's quiet. <laughs> he has got, what I, what I guess what I'm trying to get across is he has so much more than what you're now living. So much more. So much more for your family. So much more financially. So much more for your health. So much more for your desires that you've been dreaming of and asking him for. He's got so much more. I don't know what it is that we don't ask God for the much more. God, I want the much more of God. Give me the much more. I'm hungry for much more. I want, I want the much more. I, I want that much more, God. So I don't know what you've got to do in me so I can live it out, but whatever it is, I'm here because I want the much more. I want the much more. It's all about Jesus. The minute we lose sight of Jesus, Yeshua, the minute we lose sight of him, we've lost sight of the kingdom. We've lost sight of the king. We've lost sight of everything that matters. It comes back to Christ. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when I was um, praying yesterday, and um, spending time with God, he said to me, which is what the first part of the newsletter is about, he said to me, don't come to me and worship without a knife anymore. Because he wants to cut things off. Come with a knife. When Abraham worshipped with Isaac, he took a knife. He took the fire, the wood, the knife, ready to kill whatever he, God said. And as he raised the knife, God said, don't, now that I know you would put nothing in front of me, Now, I can release the place of Jehovah Jireh. So he said, don't come to worship anymore without a knife because there are things in your life that are going to ask you to cut off, things that are going to ask you to cut out, things that are no longer going to be applicable, things that are not a sin but are no longer suitable for the, 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 you know, the, the realm that you're moving into. Come with a knife. And I thought, I can't exactly put that as the heading. <laughs> Come with a knife. Because <laughs> and at the back of my head was when I was dean of a Bible college, um, our, Bible, our Bible college studies went into prisons. Oh, Lord. And there was this one prisoner who sent in an assignment. And he said, it's okay to kill somebody if God tells you to. And he used that scripture in Genesis, you know, with Abraham and the knives, something at all. So I was like, no, no, no. So I'm writing, no, 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 no. It's not okay. God would never tell you to do that. But it was like, oh, my gosh, some of the answers from the, the, the prisoners was incredible. But the thing is, how much are you willing to die? Margaret came out with the word dead men. because we were crucified with Christ. And let me tell you the rest of it. The King James is really clear on a certain aspect of that. We were crucified with Christ. And it's no longer us who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. 
And we live by the faith of the Son of God. That's the King James. We live by Jesus' faith. Not my own faith, but by the faith of Jesus. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not only the King James has got that, but I think it's just so important. Not my faith, but the faith that God gave me, the measure of faith that increases, the measure of faith that is strengthened, that measure of faith that comes from Christ because it's his life that fills me. Does this kind of make sense? Yes. So we've got to stop thinking, oh, I don't know. When I look at my life, it's like, oh, God, I need to stop thinking. I just need to stop thinking. But he loves you so much. You are one with him. Nothing, Romans chapter 8, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. It doesn't matter whether it's past or present, angels, demons. It doesn't matter what it is. It cannot separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from his love. He loves you. And he wants you to live a completely different kind of life that truly reflects Christ. You know, Galatians 4.19, Paul said, I travail until Christ is fully formed in you. Ephesians 4 talks about the fact that we grow into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Romans 8 talks about the fact that, oh, um, that we're conformed to his image. It's all about Jesus Christ manifesting in us. And as he manifests in us, it's his faith that flows through us. And so our life is a sign and a wonder that brings glory to God. He has so much more. Yes. So much more. And I pray boldly for a divine discontent to come on each and every one of you. A divine discontent, which means that it's from God, but it stirs things up so that you move into the place that he's got for you. A divine discontent. Because I don't know about you, I'm 70. I don't know how much longer I've got, like 50 years. I'm plugging for the 120. But the thing is, I want everything he's got for me. And I want to do everything he wants me to do so I can say at the end, it's finished, like Jesus. And I know that there's some things that I've left undone that I need to. I know second chance, Lord, or something. But, but can't you feel yeah. the pressure of the divine on your lives? Yeah. Because you're called. Yeah. You're called. It's not about fivefold ministry. You are called. And he's wanting you to take your place and your position. He's wanting you to rise up in the fullness of everything that you are in Christ. He's got this position for you. And it's like this, this, like God is saying, come on, come on, take that step. Take that step. And there is such a unity. Like Jesus is in us and we're in him and the Father's in us and we're in the Father. There's this unity. If I am in Christ and Christ is in me, what can separate us? I'm one with him, absolutely one. So I'll flow in his will. I'll flow in his purpose. I'll flow in him, with him, for him, through him. You know, it's a completely different level of life. But there is such a, um, oh, I feel like I failed today, but I so want you to get how much you are loved, how important you are to God's plan for, this, for, the, for the earth, how strong your faith is. And he's got this open door before you where he's saying, come on. 
It's a place that's just for you. I've just made it for you. I just need you to step in and then we can work it out. Just need you to step in because Jesus qualifies us. We're never going to qualify in our own strength. I'm never going to qualify by what I believe. I'm never going to qualify myself for anything God's called me to. Jesus is my qualification. But if I stand back and I think, well, I don't know enough and I'm not sure about that and who am I anyway and all of these thoughts that come and I, I don't take my place, I have bowed my knee to the enemy and not to Jesus Christ and cut off the flow, cut off the life force in that area. It is so important. You are so loved. And all of you, what he has for you is so much bigger than what you can see. Whatever you can see, just put bigger, more, much more. And go for it. Literally just go for it. And you know what? It doesn't matter if we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Give yourself permission to m maybe not get it right the first time around. He is the master redeemer. Yeah. Any mistake I make, he's quick to come in and sort it out for me because I just stand and go, help! And he just comes in and he sorts it out. So don't let the fear of failure or the fear of not really quite knowing what he wants, or the fear of, oh my gosh, it's been like this for so long in my life, I don't, really don't know how it's going to change. Don't let any of this thing affect you. This is a whole new thing. He wants to give you revelation. He wants you to walk by covenant. He wants you to draw near so you can enter into Goshen. It's your time. It is your time. And if it's your time, then it's your time for your destiny. And it's God's time for our nation. But this is your time. I don't know how to end these things. <laughs> Sorry? <Communion. laughs> yeah, worship and communion. Yeah. But Father God, I just pray for each and every one of us. We're all at different levels and different understandings. And, but you know exactly where each and every one of us are. But God, we want to be where you want us to be. We want to be positioned where you want us positioned. We want to be doing what you want us to do. So God, I, I ask that you would help us abandon ourselves wholly to you. Like Reese Howell's just an example. Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Maria Woodworth Edda, A.A. Allen, although he ended badly, Lord, don't quite want to go there. But, you know, there's so many others, Lord, that, that just abandoned themselves to you so you could use them in, just in a wild way that released your power and released who you are and showed the, the power of God on the earth. Father, we desire to see that. We desire to see heaven on earth. We desire what you desire. So God, we come to you and we ask you to do in us what you want done so that we will be and do and have everything you want us to be, do and have. Because in everything, all we want is you to be glorified. The only name we want exalted is to be the name of Jesus. And the only power we want to flow through our lives is the power of the Holy Ghost. So, God, we come to you by grace. Do something amazing in each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.